As we begin to explore God's word together, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that today, as we read your word and we think about it together, that you would speak to us and that you would give us hearts to believe and obey. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, sumo is huge in Japan. And some years ago, Michelle and I went to a sumo tournament. And during the tournament, just for a bit of fun, they brought out little boys in their sumo underpants to wrestle with the sumos. And it was great. For a few minutes there, the sumos threw the boys around, picked them up. But eventually the boys won and tossed the sumos to the mat. Now, that was all a lot of fun, but can you imagine what would happen if the sumos actually put all their strength and talent and skill and power into a wrestle, into a fight with those boys? It would not be a battle. The sumo and the boys are just so unevenly matched. It would be a slaughter. Now, the passage before us today is just like that. There is a battle between Jesus and the devil, but it's not an even match. It's a slaughter. Jesus is the stronger one, and the devil is powerless to stop him. Let's take a look. One day, verse 14, Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. I wonder what that man said. Verse 15. But some of them said, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. Jesus has just done a wonderful miracle, but this doesn't stop his opponents striking. They can't deny the miracle, and so they launch an attack against Jesus claiming he is demonic, and it's by the power of Beelzebel that he performs such miracles, while Beelzebel is just another name for Satan or the devil. Other opponents, it's remarkable, they just seemingly push aside the miracle that's occurred, they ignore that, and claim they want a real, powerful, clear sign from heaven to show that heaven and God are the source of Jesus' true power. Well, As often is the case, Jesus takes this controversy and uses it as an opportunity to teach the crowds, to explain who he is and his mission. First of all, though, he he highlights the stupidity of their argument. In verse 17, But he, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. But if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges." Jesus highlights their flawed logic. Satan is not going to disempower his own forces, his own demons. He's not going to divide his forces in a civil war against his own kingdom. It just doesn't make any sense. And what's more, how can these men level such an accusation against Jesus when their own disciples cast out demons also? Couldn't their own argument be used against their own disciples who also cast out demons? And so what Jesus does is shows that their argument is both illogical and really self-defeating. So having exposed the stupidity, their stupidity, Jesus now comes to his central point in verse 20. It's not by the power of the devil that he works his miracles. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, 
then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The casting out of the demon was an act of divine power and a sure sign that God's power was at work. Jesus is taking this opportunity to teach the crowds about himself. He's claiming that it's by the finger of God that he works. And in in so doing, he's alluding to the plagues and the miracles of Exodus. And in Exodus 8, it is God who is credited with doing those miracles by his finger. So Jesus is saying those miracles of Exodus have been done with the same power that you see at work today through me. The power that sent the plagues is the same power that I exercise. It's the power of God. It's by the finger of God that I do these things. In sending Jesus, God launched an offensive against Satan and evil. When Jesus works miracles, he's bringing the power and the authority of the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying as as Jesus is saying, as they witness the miracle, the kingdom of God has come upon them. It's arrived and it's caught them out. They've been taken by surprise. We need to recognize the coming of God's kingdom with Jesus. We need to think about the kingdom and experience the kingdom. The miracle shows when the kingdom comes, it's personal, powerful, and it's, it's very present. It's now. Personal because it only comes with Jesus, in the person of Jesus. Powerful as it invades the stronghold of the devil, defeats evil, and brings freedom. And present as Jesus was present in those days. So Jesus is present today by his Spirit, still bringing the kingdom, still calling people to himself. The kingdom comes to us, doesn't it, when we hear the good news, the gospel about Jesus. And we can enter that kingdom today by believing and trusting in Jesus It's not only for the future, but we can experience the power and the presence of the kingdom in our own lives today when we know Jesus personally. I want us to think about the kingdom and and if we might, just develop a kingdom awareness to experience the kingdom today personally and powerfully. So let me ask you, Have you experienced the kingdom? Is it personal and powerful and present for you? How might we experience the kingdom today? Well, if you want to experience the kingdom and the presence of God in your life and the presence of the kingdom, I think it begins, first of all, in a relationship with Jesus. Number one. To encounter the kingdom is to personally know Jesus. It's a powerful encounter. It's life transforming. It's an experience that we can live with every day. It's not enough to know about Jesus. We actually need to enter into a relationship with Jesus, to listen to him, to speak to him, uh, to, to pray, to talk to God, to say to God, I want to know you and the power of the kingdom at work in my life today. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, we trust him. We obey him. We follow him. And as he explains in verse 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. That's the key. The key to kingdom living is to know the presence and power of Jesus 
personally in our lives today. His, his opponents, they, they missed this entirely and accused him of being demonic. Having explained the source of his power, Jesus uses a parable to further explain his mission, to disarm and to uh, disempower, defeat Satan. Verse 21, Jesus says, When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when a stronger one, but when, when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armour in which he trusts and divides the spoils. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, I'm the stronger man. And the miracle proves it. Satan, fully armed and guarded, ruled over this man's life until Jesus came along and removed the demon. And Satan, who had sent the demon, could do nothing to stop Jesus. Why? Because one stronger than him had come. Because Jesus is the stronger man. When Jesus, the stronger one, comes, he releases the man from under the power of the devil. And that's the point of the imagery. Jesus attacks and overcomes Satan, disarms him and releases people from spiritual captivity, carries away the plunder. Satan may be strong, but he's powerless to stop Jesus. And with this parable, Jesus further highlights the foolishness uh, of their argument to describe him as demonic. His whole career may be seen as a battle against Satan, although it's like the battle of a sumo against a little boy. It's, it's not an even match. It's a slaughter. Satan is powerless to stop Jesus. So wh what, what's, what's a lesson for us today? I think one of the things I take from this passage is we don't need to fear Satan. Satan may be strong, but Jesus is stronger. Now, if we're living independently of Jesus, then we have a problem. But with the presence of Jesus in our lives, we don't need to be afraid. We see Jesus triumph over Satan. Sometimes when we look at the world, we can be tempted to think that the devil has won. Terrible evil and suffering fills our world. But Satan knows he's lost and his defeat is just a matter of time. The story goes that Napoleon once gathered his commanders around him and he unrolled a map of the world and much of the world was blue except for one red spot, the island of Britain. And Napoleon, having spread the map, says, if it were not for that one red spot, then I could conquer the whole world. Well, in a way, we can imagine Satan doing the same thing, unrolling a map of the universe and then pointing to that one red spot and saying, if it were not for that one red spot, then I could rule the universe. That red spot, of course, is the cross of Jesus. The location of the final battle. The healing of the mute man is just a skirmish on the way to that final battle when Jesus will finally die but rise triumphant to defeat sin and Satan and death. If not for that one red spot, then Satan could rule the universe. He could rule your life. But because of that red spot, Satan is disarmed, defeated, he's rendered helpless, and you are safe with Jesus. So how does Jesus expect us to respond once we recognise these truths about him and his mission? Take a look at verse 23. The implications of all this. 
Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. As the king of God's kingdom, Jesus comes and he comes personally and powerfully calling on you for your allegiance. Such a man de demands a response. It's not enough to remain ambivalent, agnostic, half-hearted about Jesus. Jesus says it very clearly, either you're for me or against me. There's no other position. There is no opportunity to be neutral. We need to choose a side and we need to side with Jesus. There is no neutrality. He doesn't give us that option. Jesus comes, as he describes here, to gather. We know he is gathering men from every tribe, language and nation into his family, into his kingdom. Like a shepherd, he's gathering us, his sheep. He's providing protection. And, he's, and, and we're experiencing his provision and care, his love. That's how his mission is described. But not the devil. The devil is like a wolf who scatters. He scatters the sheep in order to divide and destroy. There is no neutrality. Jesus is saying, if you're not actively gathering with me, then you're scattering with the enemy. It's very, conf very confronting. By doing nothing, you're helping the enemy prevail. As the saying goes, when good men do nothing, evil prevails. Being passive is just not an option. If the wolf attacks and we do nothing, he wins. Well, how can we side with Jesus? Just as the mute man was given a voice, so we've been given a voice. And we can use our voice to proclaim Jesus as king, individually and collectively as a church and in mission. We must raise our voices and work towards a world that knows Jesus. We must gather with him. I once heard an amazing recording of a, of a Sunday school lesson. Uh, the teacher uh, had damaged vocal cords. He, he could only speak with a husky, low voice. He was... Uh, he was disabled in that way. And, and during the lesson, as he's speaking, Jesus restores his voice. His sentence begins with a, a broken voice, but finishes with a healed and restored voice. And all this man can do, overcome with emotion, you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's what I imagine the mute man who had been released said that day. Thank you, Jesus. And you have a voice too. And that's how we can use our voices to side with Jesus. We can say thank you. We can pray. We can praise. And we can use our voices to tell our friends, our family, our community, our world about Jesus. Use your voice to gather with Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that we can know your presence and power in our lives through him. I pray that you would help each of us to come close to Jesus, to place our trust in him, to side with him, to give our allegiance to Jesus. Give us the courage to use our voices to declare your praises and to gather with Jesus, I pray. Amen.